Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the very first Diedrich Roasters and Fire Dancer Coffee Consultants Roasting Forum. I'm Connie Blumhart, founder and publisher of Roast Magazine, and I'll be your host for the event today. The team at Diedrich Roasters and Fire Dancer Coffee Consultants wanted to host this online event to help connect the coffee industry, their customers, and their friends. The last year has been a challenging time for all of us, and we're together today to communicate and share ideas with all of you. Being together in person, working side by side, learning from each other, all things that we took for granted then now seem like distant memories. So while we can't be in person for this event, there is one good thing about an online event. More people are here to join the conversation. We have over a thousand people registered from all over the world for this event today, and we're happy to have you with us. I'd like to introduce you to Carl Schmidt, CEO of Diedrich Roasters. Hello, Carl. Hello, Connie. Hello, everyone on, online. We're looking forward to talking to you in this way, but when I may go back, thank you, Connie, for setting this all up and uh, to all of them that we want to talk to. Last year, we had to learn more or less on the fly to become familiar with the Zooming and other channels of communication to be able to collaborate and communicate with our business partners and friends in the industry. Knowing that coffee is a social beverage and almost all the relationships we created in the past was through socializing face to face. It was quite a challenge to continue and to find ways nurturing and building new relationship with, without the benefit of a test run that we had and that we liked so much in order to handle the COVID situation and the, and the options available to us. Meeting and greeting others virtually is a new experience for most of us. One of the reasons we created this virtual forum to say thank you to all the coffee community and friends and your committed or continued support during this period. The fact that we were able to collaborate with such important members, friends who are presenting on this panel today tells us how important the special uh, and special the connection is within the coffee community. The Dietrich team and the Fire Dancer team is extremely pleased to be able to share today's information with you and hope that you walk away with a bit more understanding and insight from the topics we are presenting today. We are very grateful to our friends and, and the program today for Phyllis Johnson, for Rick Reinhardt, Chris Kirsten and Launcher, and Connie and her team at Roast for sharing their time and knowledge and experience with our community. Let's get started with the program. Thank you, Carl, and thank you for producing this event and letting Roast and the rest of the coffee industry be part of it. We've got a great lineup of speakers in store today. You'll be seeing Carl a lot throughout the day, Mike Ebert from Fire Dancer Coffee Consultants, Phyllis Johnson from BD Imports, Rick Reinhardt, the former executive director of the Specialty Coffee Association, Dana Wasserman from Sukafina, Eileen Schwab and Tony Tausch from Coffee Emporium, Nikki Amori from Cafe Amori, Renee Espinoza from Fire Dancer Coffee Consultants, and Lancha Taylor from the Taylor Gentleys Group. A little bit about me before we get started. I've been in the coffee industry for the past 20 years. I started publishing Roast in 2004 and our news site, Daily Coffee News, in 2012. Our mission at Roast and Daily Coffee News has always been to help educate and inform the coffee industry with content that appeals to new roasters as well as veteran roasters. And that's why I'm here today, and I'm super excited. I'm excited that we're together, even if it's just on Zoom, for some great presentations and conversations about coffee and roasting. Speaking of Zoom, by now, many of us are used to online events and meetings, but hosting a webinar for thousands of people is still a little new for us. And because most of the presentations are live, we just ask for your patience as we manage it. Our goal is to deliver a really great event for all of you. So let's get started. We have a full day with seven sessions and a question and answer period at the end of each session. 
All of the times quoted on the schedule are central time. I know it's a work day for most of you, so this will have a break between 1.30 and 2 to get some work done and come back to the webinar for the afternoon sessions. A recording of the sessions will be available after the event. We'll follow up with a survey to all attendees with the details on the recorded sessions. A few notes about the webinar setup. As attendees, you are in listen and view only mode, so you can't activate your webcam or your microphone. Your name will not be shared with others on the webinar. You can ask questions during the using the Q&A function. They'll be answered by the panelists in the Q&A session after the presentation or by a message from the ROSE team here who are helping behind the scenes. We'll do our best to answer all the questions with our goal of sharing knowledge and having a productive conversation. The chat function will be on so you can chat with other attendees, but please note that if you use the chat window, your name may be shared with other attendees. So as you can see, we're trying to make this open, fun, and engaging for everyone. But with all of that comes a responsibility to be respectful of each other. We have a code of conduct that everyone must adhere to. It would be really disappointing if someone were to violate this code, but please know that if that happens, we will quickly remove anyone involved from participating any further. I'm optimistic that everyone here is awesome and everyone here is, is here to listen and learn about roasting, chemistry, cupping, coffee farming, and much, much more all while being decent human beings. So let's do it. Let's get this first session going. Our first session is The New Rule of Quality by Rick Reinhardt. Rick has worked in the coffee industry for the past 32 years. Rick spent 12 of those years as executive director of the Specialty Coffee Association. Rick has proven strong business development, professional skills and negotiation, corporate social responsibility, business planning, operations management, and sales. Hello, Rick. Hello, Connie, and hello, everybody. And how'd I do here? Did I actually appear on screen? It looks like I did. All right. You're good. All right. All right. And I'm going to go to share screen and throw a presentation up. Yeah, and I'll leave you to it. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be, wherever you are in the world. Um, uh, I should note that uh, I love that the, the picture of me was from, uh, I suppose, about four years ago. And uh, I uh, tried to retire from the coffee business uh, at the end of 2019, along with apparently everybody else in the world when COVID hit. Uh, and uh, one of the things I uh, decided to do was to stop wearing uh, neckties and sports coats. And apparently I decided to stop cutting my hair, which uh, is sort of where I am today. So here I am. Uh, from beautiful Southern California in, uh, in my natural environment. Uh, I'm going to talk today a bit about quality. And uh, the title was meant to be a bit provocative. Um, there's never any new rules around quality, but there is a chance to explore something around it. And then to think about how quality will factor in to our coffee work and our coffee lives going forward. So I'm going to try and dive in here and walk you through um, some thoughts about quality. Let's see. Bear with me. Well, hopefully this is going to work. All right. All right. I'm going to depend on somebody out there to tell me that this screen that is in front of you now is, uh, is a, uh, a slide that has a a one box and a two box on it. Uh, Looks good, Rick. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, uh, uh, as Connie noted, these are all live, or at least this one's live, so uh, bear with me. So um, before we talk about quality, we should probably sort of define what it is we're talking about. Um, and these are the sort of two significant uh, definitions you know, pared down to their to their basics when we talk about quality. And by the way, we're in coffee, so we love to talk about quality. Quality is the thing we that we obsess about, that we talk about all the time, that we toss out lots of, um, of verbiage about and uh, often have very strongly held opinions about. So it's a conversation that happens a ton. So what are we talking about when we talk about quality? 
Well, the first and, and easiest definition of quality is this one. It's an attribute or a feature of something or someone. It's a characteristic that, uh, that a thing or a person uh, possesses. So, you know, I have, uh, I have the quality of being verbose. So I talk a lot. I make lots of words. That's a feature that I possess. But we also talk about quality as the standard of something as we measure it against other things of a similar kind. So there are other people who also talk a lot, but some of them are very interesting. So you might say they have a higher quality of verbosity than someone like me. So these are two ways that we can use this word quality. And while they seem relatively distant from each other, one is a thing, a characteristic that a thing has, another is a comparative, they end up being intertwined all the time. And part of the challenge of having a conversation around quality is this um, sense of interchangeability or at least a significant amount of overlap between these two aspects of the definition of quality. So we'll dig in a little deeper and sort of explore um, the implications of that. If uh, my slide will advance. All right, so, <laughs> Here's a thing about quality. This is a, uh, this is a blueberry cake and uh, I was inspired to put this up here uh, because uh, my wife passed a, a lot of the time of, of last year um, checking in on the, on the uh, great British baking show. And so I got to absorb some of it from the sidelines. But if we look at this, um, the first uh, reaction is probably, and mine was like, wow, that's a high quality cake. But I wanted to step back and look at some other things. There is a attribute to this cake, which is very eye-catching, which is it's got this um, high gloss finish. So you see this in, in uh, particularly in chocolates and tempered chocolates, you get this, this mirror glaze finish, they, uh, it's called, I gather. And you can look at this and go, wow, that is a characteristic of this cake. That is a quality that this cake possesses. It has this mirror glaze finish. It also subtly sends a message to us because it has this finish, which we associate with a certain level of competence in creating a cake. It sends a message to us that this is probably a high quality cake, not just possessing the quality of a mirror finish, but that the cake itself might be a very high quality. And there are other clues into this. If you look at the gold leaf work, you look at the blueberries artfully placed there, there is a sense in general that there is elevated quality here so that when compared to other cakes, this might be a better tasting cake than most. However, we don't know that. We can't taste this cake. We only have this set of clues and it becomes very tempting for us to intersect this idea of a quality, a characteristic that this cake possesses and some preconceived notions we have about how it's going to compare to all the other cakes in the world. And the gut reaction to this is to say, wow, that is a high quality cake, but I don't know if it's high quality cake. It may be awful. It may be a beautiful to look at cake that tastes terrible. It may be, as Paul Hollywood says, a little stodgy. So let's take a look at some other ways to look at quality. This is one of my favorite um, sort of things to use as a comparative uh, when we talk about quality as the similar a similar set of characteristics across a range of, of potentials. Um, I used to talk a lot about it in wine, but I feel like we've thrashed the, the wine analogy to death with coffee. So you know, I wanna take the moment to, to look at a different uh, approach to it. So here we have the, uh, the lovely 1986 Yugo in the, in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, the Yugo is sort of emblematic of a certain kind of quality, a, a certain uh, range of parameters, uh, not necessarily um, towards the top or even towards the middle. I dare say we tend to put the Yugo down there at the bottom. On the right-hand side of your screen is the 2018 uh, Ferrari Portofino. Um, also evocative of some level of quality. And we tend to think of that as at the high end of the spectrum. And we might have that impression based on the visuals alone, um, looking at the Yugo, it doesn't uh, give you the sense that, uh, that the quality of manufacturing is super high. And 
I'm not certain that uh, that we would think of it as having um, characteristics that we would identify as appealing, as opposed to the Ferrari we look at, and, and we have a visual characteristics. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful color, a beautiful finish. Um, even the photography itself is gorgeous. Everything about it suggests that comparatively, this is of higher quality. And in fact, that's probably true. But it's interesting to examine the intersection of those two aspects of a characteristic and a sense of a comparative value. So here's what I want to talk about with this. What we're really looking at here is about empirical evidence. And empirical evidence is very simply information that um, we obtain through observation or documentation, um, gathering of data, and often in the scientific method through experimentation and repeatability of experimentation. So that's evidence. That's, that's the way that we inform our, our decision-making, our thinking, and our notions about things. And when we look at empirical evidence, there's really two broad categories. The first is quantitative, and this is numerical, numerical data. It's typically obtained through measurement. It's analyzable. You can apply statistical analysis or mathematical models to it um, to really parse out at a, at a quantitative measurable level um, how something performs. And then there's qualitative uh, uh, empirical evidence. And this is uh, information about a thing that's generally not measurable. And the nature of that not measurableness of, uh, of this kind of qualitative evidence is that it's prone to being very subjective. Um, the analysis uh, can move in the direction of the analyzer and there are um, inherent biases and, and implicit biases that um, can occur when making the analysis of these qualitative uh, uh, bits of empirical evidence. So here's some empirical evidence um, of a quantitative nature for our friend, the Ferrari. The 2018 Portofino um, was generating 592 brake horsepower um, a ton. Uh, it's uh, listed as having a top speed of 199 miles per hour, and it gets from zero to 60 in just three and a half seconds. Now, this is data that's, um, that's measurable, it's analyzable, and it's comparable. We can look at how that compares to other cars in terms of how much horsepower and top speed and its uh, acceleration from zero to 60. We can also see the qualitative data. This is the Ferrari's own description of this car, that it's synonymous with elegance, sportiness, and understated luxury. And that's arguable, um, but probably acceptable. I would say this reaches into useful qualitative information, certainly relative to, uh, to the Yugo. Um, we can make that comparison. The Yugo, just for a point of information, uh, has a 54 brake horsepower, a top speed of 90 miles per hour, and gets from zero to 60 in just under a minute. Um, so as a, as a quantitative uh, analysis and ultimately forming a comparative analysis, what is the quality of a Yugo relative to the quality of a Ferrari Portofino? Um, that they're, they're miles and miles apart. Qualitatively, um, it seems unlikely that we would look at the Yuga and suggest that it's in any way related to uh, much less synonymous with elegance or luxury or sportiness. Um, it might be, um, its qualitative nature might be much more centered around uh, its low cost, um, or its uh, availability in certain geographies. Uh, it, was, it was certainly not a thing that we would have qualitatively said, hey, this is, this is uh, right in there with a Ferrari. So there's a big qualitative gap um, between the Yugo and the Ferrari, and there's a similar quantitative gap. The quantitative gap is measurable. We can look at it and we can make decisions based on that data. We can, we can analyze that data. And we could do comparative things. We could say, what is the dollar value um, of 199 mile per hour top speed if we assess it in the cost of the Ferrari versus the cost of the Yugo and, and try to understand that. There's lots of um, uh, tools we could apply to make some 
quantitative analysis of the overarching quality of, uh, of these vehicles. Much harder to do on a qualitative basis. How much more rewarding is it to drive the Ferrari than it is to drive the Yugo? Um, how much more appealing is it to see the Ferrari in your driveway as opposed to seeing the Yugo in your driveway? Um, a whole series of, of uh, very subjective things that are challenging for us to measure effectively and that are subject to our own biases. So when we talk about coffee quality, when we move this conversation about quality over to our industry and start to think about how we, how we imagine coffee quality, I mean, it's worth visiting sort of how the industry has approached this. So our first conversations about coffee quality generally tend to reside in aspect grading. And by aspect grading, we're talking about the uniformity of the coffee beans, the absence of defects, um, the color. Um, we could, in fact, take some measurements of water activity or moisture content. Um, all those things are the aspects of the green coffee. So it's looking at the green coffee as it appears in the world. And that bit of assessment is relatively quantitative, that it is measurable. There's no certainty that measuring those things will determine uh, unequivocally what the quality of the coffee beverage is going to be, or even the, 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 the quality of the coffee product of roasted coffee. It gives us some clues, much like the mirror glaze on our blueberry cake, um, good performance in aspect grading suggests that it's probably going to be a good quality coffee, but there's no guarantee of that. In fact, that quantitative analysis is just a first step in setting up some notions about how things might be. So traditionally in, in the coffee industry, the next step is, of course, organoleptic analysis, which we like to think of as coffee cupping. Um, and we have developed a set of protocols, rituals, language, uh, and, and information systems around this idea of organoleptic analysis. And in the end of the day, we strive to make the empirical evidence of organoleptic analysis as quantitative as possible. And this is the first significant um, intersectional problem that we have in the qualitative versus quantitative definition of quality, because we assign numerical values and we have a relatively strict protocol and we can implement this across a lot of geographies. We tend to want to believe that organoleptic analysis is in fact largely quantitative, but it's not. Um, it is in fact qualitative. And because it's qualitative, it's, uh, there's a significant element of subjectivity in there. And there is a tendency towards bias. And we'll talk more about what those biases are. The next step, of course, is tasting, which is different than cupping. And when we say tasting, what we're talking about is tasting the actual beverage produced by, by the coffee. So the cupping ritual, the organoleptic analysis, is a, is a laboratory exercise, if you will. We do that assessment under a strict set of protocols with coffee roasted in a particular way, with coffee dosed in a particular way, with coffee brewed in a particular way, and with coffee um, consumed in a particular way. Tasting is very different. Tasting is brewing a cup of coffee or brewing an espresso or, or making uh, a, a coffee beverage from the coffee and then tasting it and having a reaction to that. Um, this tastes good. This tastes better than other coffees I have tasted. My sensory memory says this is exceptional. My sensory memory says this is acceptable. And clearly this is a qualitative analysis. It is most generally a comparative that's done against our memories. In the best case scenario, it's a comparative tasting where we put several different beverages on the table and taste them side by side. And then we're able to make a, a um, more reliable kind of qualitative judgment, but we're still subject to our own biases to um, external factors and a whole range of things that make it very hard to think of this as a, in any way, shape or form, a quantitative analysis. Even though we might rank a panel of beverages from favorite to least favorite or give them a score from one to 10, um, those um, trappings of quantitative analysis are, 
are, are really just that. They are, they are not quantitative. They are part of a qualitative analysis. And then the last piece you see up there is sampling. And when I say sampling, what I'm really referring to is expanding the judgment of quality outside of the circle of the industry. That is the green coffee buyers or the cuppers or the quality control folks, um, or even the internal staff within a, within a coffee company or within a coffee uh, house. Sampling goes out to the ultimate end user, to the consumer. So how do consumers react to this coffee? Do they find this coffee uh, rewarding? Does it meet their expectations? Does it exceed their expectations? Does it fall short of their expectations? Does it have um, attributes that they like or attributes that they dislike? Um, and then sampling really is at its best uh, at judging the reaction of our consumers. And often we judge that based on, did they buy it? Did they return to buy it again? It is also possible to do that sampling in a more structured way. And find out how they perceived it, gather that data, and it gives us information about the quality of our product. So let's take a look at this in its totality. We are starting from green coffee, and we're going through all the processes that we end with a coffee beverage in the hands of a consumer. And that beverage could take almost any form. It could be an espresso, it could be a drip coffee, it could be uh, a uh, ready to drink product, it could be a cold brew, it could be any of any number of potential beverages. And it starts from that green coffee and goes through a series of transformations. So you can see this, the connection of quality across that you, spectrum. Uh, could you try again? Sorry about that. Uh, you can see that that, connect, okay. that connection to quality gets increasingly tenuous as we go across the spectrum. So it's something we need to think about when we start thinking about coffee quality. Is it really um, quantitative at any point? And if so, what is the relationship of that quantitative analysis to qualitative analysis? And in truth, how does that fit in with our judgments from the purchase point of green coffee to the point of consumption by a consumer? Going back to our cake again, this is the point. We make a series of assessments about the likely quality of this cake. It's very dependent on, on uh, external factors that are in themselves subjective. I look at this cake and I think this is beautiful. This is a, a cake that demonstrates a commitment to craftsmanship, mastery of skills. And that all suggests that um, part and parcel of that will be how does it taste? that the creator of this cake will be equally as concerned about the flavor and the texture and the, the gustatory elegance of this cake as they will be with its appearance. There are really no guarantees for that. How does this apply to coffee and why is this all appearing in the new rule of quality? Well, here's my point. That, uh, that uh, cappuccino that's being poured there with the beautiful latte art starting to emerge from it, that is the coffee house experience, the specialty coffee experience that we acculturated consumers to uh, over the past 20 years. We started to push them towards this idea of quality, which by the way, has a bunch of external signals, very much like our blueberry cake. This is a got a commitment to elegance, a suggestion of craftsmanship, and the idea that quality is going to be pervasive, that there's going to be a quantifiable quality in that cup, that, that this is going to be, by empirical evidence, a great tasting cup of coffee. Although that's not necessarily true. It may just be visually appealing. Over the last 15 months or 16 months or so, um, our coffee experience has changed fairly dramatically. And for most people, that coffee experience has become the, the picture on the right. It's that cup of coffee brewed at home, probably consumed while you're on a call like this one, um, and going through all the adaptations for um, <coughs> your life and your livelihood and, uh, and your way of being in the world that happened to, to around all of us over the course of this, uh, this pandemic. And there's a different set of messages in that. That cup sends a different idea about the quality of what's in it. It's also a little more connected to us as individual consumers because the likelihood that we brewed that coffee for ourselves 
is much greater than the likelihood that we brewed that coffee on the left. And this is an important thing to consider when we talk about how the ultimate arbiter of quality, the consumer, is viewing quality today. For starters, that consumption is happening without the influence of this guy. So for a good part of the last decade, someone like this, some barista in some coffee house somewhere, has sent a message about quality, some of it in the steps that they take to, man to make a beverage, some of it in the words that they say, some of it in a host of um, ancillary clues, much like our blueberry cake. There are clues scattered all around this environment, scattered around what the person is wearing, how they appear, how they talk about coffee, what they might say or suggest. And they started to drive us towards an impression of quality. And those impressions of quality, well, they're important, and, and meaningful to us are not actually the sensory quality that we get from that cup of coffee. There are influences that are external to that cup of coffee and they make us think that we know something about its quality. More uh, commonly over the last, uh, the last 16 months, our experience with coffee has been more like this. Um, we know that for the first time in the, in the history of an economic downturn, we've seen specialty coffee consumers take their specialty habit home with them. And a lot of folks have learned how to make coffee at home um, that's um, meant to be as compelling or as satisfying for their coffee experience and appetite as that beautiful latte or beautiful cappuccino was in the environment that was a specialty coffee house prior. The qualitative aspects of this have changed. Some of it is really organoleptic, not in the cupping sense, but in the sampling sense for consumers today. They've had control of that coffee from roast to grind to uh, brewing and ultimately to consumption in a way that they haven't had in the past. And it's made them rethink some things about quality. Some of the indications are that um, consumers have, um, have broadened their horizon of what quality might be considerably. Um, and we've seen that the um, attention towards the very, very highest quality as defined by the industry is not necessarily what's captivating consumers. Consumers are, particularly younger consumers are moving towards better quality coffee at home, but not necessarily um, the sort of pinnacle of quality that we might've tried to present in the coffee house. This is particularly interesting. Um, a lot of words on the screen here, my apologies for that, um, but I wanna walk through a couple of things that are important. One is that when we talk about consumers in the current environment, I have a tremendous amount of focus on millennials. There's somewhere around 75 or 80 million of those consumers in the US today. And they are the emergent consumers, the ones most likely to buy coffee, they're the ones most likely to buy specialty coffee, and they're the ones driving um, consumption in the US. Uh, our friend Heather Ward, who uh, was with the SCAA and, and later with the SCA, wrote this um, uh, in analyzing some research that once millennials interact with the product, the first thing they do is they turn to social media to review it and to ask their friends for advice on how to make a purchase decision. Um, that is very different uh, than how my generation interacted with products. Also from the NCA, from their National Coffee Drinking Trends, Another interesting point, two thirds of 18 to 34 year olds in the US consumed a single serve ready to drink coffee beverage today. They drank a cold brew or some other ready to drink version of coffee today, a very different experience than that, uh, that uh, latte or, or cappuccino that we saw. More than 80% of millennials say that they understand what is meant by sustainable coffee. And 86% of them say, that they will pay more for coffee that's sustainably sourced and produced. Um, we can read this and we can take that with a grain of salt. Do, do millennials in particular or consumers in general really pay more for sustainable uh, products? Well, we're not certain of that, but we do know this. Very recent research conducted by uh, a group of Italian researchers suggests something that is um, emerging as a result or certainly contemporaneously with the pandemic. Increasingly, individuals are paying a lot more attention to the ecological impact of their consumption, looking at the origin of their raw materials and making an assessment about sustainability of the foods and beverages that they consume. 
This is important to note. This is likely to be a long-term and persistent outcome of COVID, a reset of our social consciousness and the emerging millennial consumer group will be driving this. So what does it all mean? Here's what it means in terms of the new rule for coffee quality. We need to refocus and move away from the beginning of coffee quality where the industry uh, actors rule, where industry actors define quality, they make the assessments of quality, they identify what they believe is empirical and try to translate that against the qualitative um, uh, evidence to suggest coffee quality. Today, we can reverse that. We can start talking about how the consumer perceives quality. And here's what we know about that, particularly among younger consumers. Sustainable production is a quality, an aspect, a characteristic of coffee that's meaningful to that consumer group. Being ecologically uh, friendly to being environmentally friendly, which is in fact a portion of sustainable production, but it defines part of it. That eco-friendliness is also an attribute or a characteristic of coffee, one that can be measured empirically and that can be quantitative, uh, that's important to consumers. We know that, uh, that younger generation of consumers <clears throat> go out to their peer groups to make comparisons. Is, do you also perceive that this is sustainably produced? <clears throat> Have you seen the data to suggest that this is eco-friendly? Do you regard this as a good product produced by a good company? And, and distributed in a, in a socially conscious way. That assessment is being done all the time in real time um, through social media and a host of other outlets. And finally, sampling remains the ultimate arbiter of quality. Ultimately, consumers make the decision. I like this, I don't like this. This is better than what I'm used to. It's not as good as what I'm used to. This array of qualitative assessments this array of empirical evidence are going to be the quality judgments that consumers make into the future. Let me close by raising one other issue. When we talk about the language of quality, when we talk about the attempts to make characteristics of green coffee translate into our perception of the flavors and attributes of a coffee beverage, the language we use, the idiom we use, the perspective we have, is one that has been largely driven by a relatively small group of folks. It's largely been driven by mostly white men working in the industry over time. And the perspective is inevitably influenced by the narrowness of that group. The consumer who consumes coffee today is not in any way a reflection of that very narrow group of quality definers. So today's quality rules are dependent on broadening not only our perception of quality, not only understanding the relationship between quantitative and qualitative indicators, but understanding that those who sit in judgment of quality are reflective of the entire population of coffee consumers and not a narrow one. And there I go. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Rick. Of course, a very interesting look at the perceptions of quality and how it affects the coffee industry today. I have one note before we move to the next session. If you are in the chat window, we notice we have a lot of chats, but they're mostly from attendees to panelists. If you look to the bottom of the chat window, there's a little blue box highlighted. You need to change that to say panelists and attendees, and then you can all chat together. You won't just be chatting to the panelists. All right, our next session is the chemistry of coffee. You briefly met Carl earlier, but here's a little bit more about Carl. Carl's been an active industry leader in the food and beverage industry for the past 40 years. In addition to his global business outlook and perspective, he brings a vast knowledge in process engineering, business and product development, customer service, and strategy development to the coffee, beverage, and cocoa industry. He's worked for global companies such as Alpha Laval, a Swedish multinational group, and served as the president and member of the board of the Probat group of companies, including Probat Burns, 
in the North American market from 1989 to 2016. We're going to start with this, the sustainability and what we're looking at here uh, in talking about chemistry in coffee, which is a subject that we're teaching. And it's basically, I mean, it's taking us a week for, for the subject and from one of the semesters. I mean, it is, it's, it's material for an entire semester in, in, uh, in, in college. Uh, so please bear with me um, uh, when I'm talking about in some sessions or in some segments as too nerdy of stuff, I mean, uh, to, to present. But uh, I apologize for that, but I'm trying to make it as, as, uh, as clear as possible. What you're looking at here is the, uh, the a wonderful product created by nature, sustainable through photosynthesis. And uh, when, we're, when we're looking at the photosynthesis define it, which is basically responsible for the growth of the plant, then we're looking at carbon dioxide plus water, and energy would then, would then form the uh, carbohydrates and plus oxygen. Uh, in, in, in I'm, I'm basically skipping over the equation, what it means in chemistry of, uh, of growing this plant, but you're taking basically uh, six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules, which are converted by light and energy captured by chlorophyll, which is in the, in the, in the uh, equation uh, shown by, by an error. And all of that we're converting into sugar molecules and six oxygen molecules. Why do I say that? Because we will come back in the chemistry of coffee, we'll come, always come back to carbon, to carbon, um, um, uh, to carbon, to the molecules, to the oxygen, to the um, uh, hydrogen uh, molecules or, or components that include all of that uh, in order to understand what the the, uh, the little coffee bean as converter uh, is providing to us uh, while we're uh, processing uh, the coffee. What you're looking at here is the green coffee. We really cut through the beans. We wanted to show when you cut through the beans, this very healthy looking quality bean and the quality of coffee depends on certainly I mean, the, the, the quality the, uh, in the bean itself. You're looking at the thin uh, wax layer, the embryo, the mucilage, the silver skin, which is then later also called the chaff and parent schema. Um, all of this, this contributes in a healthy bean to the quality, the quality of the roach, of the, of the, of the coffee, which is basically the major determinant for aroma and taste development during the roasting process. There is not such a thing like the optimal roast. The roast master, the roast master is basically the master, the controller of the quality of the coffee, of the flavor and the aroma development. He or she knows what, what they can develop and how they can develop through designing this profile. They know when they roast the coffee, if they want to reside in a sweet floral or bread or nutty character through a, a, a normal roast, or they have a medium dark roast, or maybe a darker roast where they're looking for flavor components like more spicy, phenolic, ashy, dark, or ra a, a roast in, in the roast flavor. And and and, and this says this says it. Just let's let's go to the to, to the process of roasting just to recalling what what uh, what we're looking at what constituents do we have available for when we're charging a roaster with coffee you see here again the the, the bean the structure with the skin the pulp and bean silver skin um uh, pergamino and 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 that is all within this coffee bean that is being presented to us but look at the constituents that we're 55 to 60 percent are carbohydrates we're going to get to those we have 11 percent of protein we have six to 12 percent of oil and 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 acid lipids uh, and, and other lipids sorry water 10 to 13 percent free water that is available to us and the importance we get to 15 to 20 percent of acids and then the new nu nutrients in the green coffee um all of which are very important um, includes, including, and last but not least, the so-called alkaloids, of which 
One is the very important, and it's basically the reason that we're drinking coffee is caffeine. Now, what does it all do in, in the roasting process? This is a very simplified uh, chart or um, uh, schematic that shows what happens. We're charging a roaster at a charging temperature, depending on the roast quality. The, the, the coffee, the green coffee itself, and, and Mike will talk about green coffee and the agricultural part and the, po uh, 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 the, the uh, post uh, uh, processing after picking, but we're charging the roast with, with a batch of, of, of coffee and, and applying an energy to the, to the coffee. Air is roasting coffee. But we're having, we're talking about several different um, uh, energy supplies to the coffee. One is the most important is convection, and second thing is conduction, and the third one is radiant. Radiant is kind of a minor heat uh, process or uh, application to the coffee, um, because radiant means with no contact. Now, no matter what roaster we have and what technology we apply. The, the majority of, of the uh, coffee that being roasted obviously is convection, it's a forced convection, and then conduction. Ideally, we want the conduction uh, process to happen from bean to bean, uh, but the majority will be uh, convection. However, it is very important to control those both, both heat trans, uh, transfers to the, uh, to the coffee. What you see here, once you charge the roaster and you're coming around the turning point, and then you walk up the defined time temperature profile. During that time, as soon as you come around the turning point and you hit, and you hit the lower tail end of this profile that you designed, that's where it starts to become really interesting and for all the chemical reactions to happen. Here is where the roast master decides how fast he passes through these moments, through these segments of of allowing the chemical reactions to happen and, and develop the compounds for flavor and aroma all the way to the first crack after which then the development starts of the coffee. That means the more flavor and aroma compounds and the longer the time we, or, or the, the, the time we have given the chemical reactions to happen the more we have basically available at the end, at the means after the first crack in order to develop the coffee. I'm just bringing this as, an, as this profile up there for recording. This is what we're dealing with. We're going to get a little bit more or by way more detailed into the chemical reactions and come back uh, uh, to a similar chart. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the most important criteria is no matter how, no matter what coffee technology or roasting technologies you basically apply, important is if you make comparison is the, the, certainly the quality of coffee, but also the time um, of, the, of the, roast, the roasting time itself. And last but not least, it is the end temperature, which is related to a color of the roast. It's certainly the end temperature, but more so the color of the roast. You can have a long roast with an end temperature of, let's say, 410 degrees. You can have a shorter roast with an end temperature of 410 degrees. In all cases, we need to look at the color. And in all cases, you, you may get or you most likely get different aroma and, and, and flavor profiles or aromatics that you develop during this process, because it's depending how fast you're going through the chemical reaction phase of the roasting profile. Here are the various, uh, and then if we, if we comparing what we have in the green coffee chemistry, just with reference to the earlier chart, what we have available to us, aside from caffeine, between Arabica and Robusta, as you can see, Robusta has a higher con caffeine content, but the carbohydrates are pretty much in the same, in the same range. 
some during the roasting, some of those, not all of them, uh, are being converted or we're doing anything to them. But we focus on ma mainly on the carbohydrates because the carbohydrates, those are the sugar components. And sugar, sugar is the most important precursor of all the flavor com compounds and acidities or the acids that we're de developing during the roast. Now, if we like it or not, but our green people, green coffee people, they know by way more about that. And certainly, again, Mike, Mike uh, Ebert will talk about that. But we're getting already when we're buying, when we're purchasing beans, then they had already, they went through a certain process, a post-picking process. And, and depending on this post-picking process, we already getting coffees with certain traits and notes. Like for example, when you take the parchment, which is the parchment dried coffee, which delivers a little bit more acidity um, um, and, um, and, and si the, the simple sugars are, are kind of, I mean, washed out. In the, in the, in the pulp dried coffee, with, with the, uh, have a lower, generally known as the lower acidity um, and uh, with bigger body, in the fruit dried coffee, you got like the, the, the red fruit with a big body and more earthy note. And then the sun dried, which is also known for uh, the, uh, the, the earthy and more uh, a, a spicy note on that. The, the interesting part, what we also know from the coffee origins, like for like the, the African coffee with, with their... Um, um, uh, the strong and rich flavor, interesting flavor with bright acidity, uh, maybe except for the Ethiopian coffee, which have a delightful, beautiful uh, flavor. Um, um, and then you have, on the other hand, you have like Brazilian coffee, which are, I mean, very nice and, and excellent for blending. The biggest challenges for for or, or they lend themselves for blending, but the biggest challenge for a cuppa or a coffee taster is to really try to develop your own kind of library of learning about the different traits, the different flavors of coffee. It takes a long time to become a qualified cuppa uh, in, 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 in this uh, coffee uh, cupping or in this coffee environment and, and learning about coffees. I mean, if, if you for looking at if the, just the numbers of flavors that we're talking in, in coffee um, of over 850 defined in green coffee, which we're basically doing roast even even a develop further. But bear in mind, a, 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 a beer has maybe 250. Um, wine has 500. Roasted coffee has over 1000. And, 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 and it's taking a long time for, for green coffee, uh, uh, for a cup of coffee to learn the traits and understand the, 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 the nuances that we're looking for. We're going to back, back here to the, uh, the roasting and flavor in order to stand really the big picture of, uh, of the chemistry of that. We need to understand the physical changes that go through. Now, as earlier I mentioned, there is free water available. Green coffee has between, uh, let's say, nine and twelve percent of water content. Free water. The the physical changes, with reference to evaporation, the boiling of water, the moisture and inside the bean, very important com uh, 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 component and, and and reaction to understand the chemical reaction forming uh, new dis uh, new substances within the bean, important to understand. Chemical reaction breaking down substance within the bean is, is another one. And if, if we're going on, that the state of, of matter and phase change, the atoms, the molecules, the compound families, and the taste, the chemical reaction, the acids, and last but not least, the pH that we're basically trying to determine in the, in the, in the, um, in the cup of coffee, 
all of that is very important to understand. And this is what we're focusing on. And this is what we're, we're going to go a little bit more into detail. So talking about the free water inside and around the beans, we're exposing the bean to, to the, the, uh, the airflow, uh, uh, which is uh, convection air, and, and certainly on the other hand, conduction air during the roast. And first of all, the free water that is available is absorbed by the airflow that we're applying to the beans. So there's enough, to, there's enough airflow to pick up the water and that's the so-called evaporation process. Um, once once we, we went through um, th this evaporation process and have absorbed the, 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 the water and being able to enter now with the continuous uh, heat uh, 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 process and, 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 um, and delivery to the beans, we're now slowly heating up the, the, the center of the beans and or going into the center of the beans. So saying, for example, that the beans is roasted from outside, inside, uh, that's not exactly true. We're depending incredibly, I mean, we're depending on the water inside the bean. We need to heat up the water to a point that the water inside the bean is, is boiling and is now we're changing the face, as you can see here, the face to like the gas or vapor. So at that point in time, we crossed the line of 100 degrees C or 220 degrees F, and we're now within the in the um, in the in the gas or in the in a vapor situation. We're, we're talking about uh, vapor vaporization, and this is we go on since we're continuously adding temperature or energy to the coffee. We're increasing the temperature in the bean higher than the 100 degrees C. In, in, the, in the vaporization station, 120 degrees C and higher. And this allows us now to break down the, chemi the chemicals, the, the chemical constituents inside the beans all the way to the, to the center. And this is going to help us, this process, with the amount of air that we're basically sending to the, to the coffee beans or into the batch, the velocity that crosses the beans and the temperature that we're holding inside, keeping the um, the, the water in an, uh, or the, the in the in the vaporization station, that helps us to roast the beans, breaking down the constituents from the inside, and helps us to roast the beans from the inside. Uh, so all the substances, the substance that we're converting, works it the, the opposite now the opposite way from the heat and air that's being uh, uh, going through the. Um, the, the, the outside shell into the center of the bean. <clears throat> now, uh, we have about, in, in all the flavor comp compounds, all the flavor components that we're, that we're basically looking at, that's about 20, 30, 28 to 30 of them. We're basically characterizing and, 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 and reducing our aromas that we can talk and can perceive um, in, in, um, uh, in our palate um, down to six, down to six, what you see here. The sweet, the sweet or caramel, the, the roasty flavors, the fruity flavors, spicy, smoky, and earthy. And, and when we take this further, then this type of flavor profile or these flavor constituents, they, we'll find that in, when we go to cupping. How do we cup? We cup by elimination. We know we basically, elimination means we can, we can pick up sweetness, we can pick up saltiness, we can pick up sour, and we can pick up bitter. All of those, we do, we do cup by elimination in order to find the constituents that lead to, uh, uh, to these uh, flavor and aroma profiles. In order to understand them further, what that means is we got to understand the molecular structure of those compound and families in order to come up with a taste. We need to know how they work. We need to understand what's an atom. 
What, how is it charged? Is it positive or a negative charge? Negatively charged? Is it, one, is it one or two that are combined? Or is it two that would have to be separated? All of that is very important to understand, understanding the, 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 uh, uh, the, the coffee chemistry. And when we know that, then we understand how these flavor or taste profiles how can we uh, allocate them to the various sweetness, uh, the sweetness, like the sweet profiles, like, for example, what, what is sweetness, what we're finding? Sucrose, fructose, and, 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 and glucose. What is a simple sugar? When we get to this, and what is, a, what is an, 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 um, a reduced sugar? Is sugar tasting different from honey and honey different from candy? That is what the same thing when it comes to sourness. Is it vinegar has a different sourness and appearance or a, a feeling, mouth feeling, than lemon and, and, and limes and, and yogurt. And that goes also. This, you're going to see this, you're going to see this chart several times that during the next uh, uh, during the next uh, few minutes uh, to define saltiness, bitterness, and umami. Those are very important. Where do they come from? Where do these components um, uh, and, and molecules uh, come from and how do they develop? In order to, to, for that to understand, first of all, let's define the carbohydrates. Remember the, the incredible uh, amount of carbohydrates, which are basically consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a, in a ratio of one to two to one. Carbohydrates can be defined as monosaccharides, monomers. Monosaccharides means one sugar unit, simple sugars. And they are defined as fructose, glucose, galactose, arabinose. Then we got the disaccharides or oligosaccharides. That those are the sugars that like is sucrose, maltose, and lactose. Now I'm going to say here, sucrose is the Simple sugar is table sugar. Sucrose is a non, it's a, it's a, 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 a non-reducing sugar. And, and what are we going to do with that? Sucrose is abundantly available within in the green bean and will play a, a major role in caramelization. And last but not least, we have within the family of carbohydrates, we have polysaccharides. And those are galactose, cellulose, and starch. And they play a big role. However, they play more a role within the shell than the actual structure of the plant or of the coffee bean. That's where the polysaccharides means poly means many of them, many of, 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 of sim, uh, single sugars are being combined to align to a chain of, of, uh, of, of sugars, which is called the, the uh, polysaccharides. Now, um, the, um, with all of those, we're defining the flavors and aromas that come off. I'm skipping this here because it, it's, it's going to come again a little bit later, but all of those, what all of the phenolic flavors, the, the, what are, do, that do the hydrocarbons, I mean, cause? the pyrroles, the furans, the pyrazines, all of them will be developed during this, uh, during the, uh, the um, uh, reaction, uh, chemical reaction stages coming around the turning point of roastnut and, and walking our way up to the, to the first, uh, for the first crack. But in order to really, really uh, understand what, what that means, we got to basically recall the types or the four most important times of chemical reactions, in particular in the field of operation that we are in, roasting coffee. There's first of all, there's the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the synthesis, um, which, which has an, an, uh, the, the definition. And you have basically two, uh, two different um, molecules and they, we want them to, to, uh, to combine uh, to one, this is the that's the the the, the uh, form of 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 synthesis, and um, the the actual definition is that the synthesis reactions are reactions 
of different atoms or molecules, interact molecules or compounds. Most of the time, when a synthesis reaction occurs, energy is released and reaction is exotherm. The next one is the um, uh, a, a, a decomposition, um, which basically has a molecule and is to one or the other way of uh, um, reaction separates both of them. Um, this can be done through oxidation. This can be done to uh, 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 degrade the de de degradation um, and other forms of separating uh, a molecule. Single uh, displacement means that there's a molecule with another one, but they want to, because of the, 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 the uh, um, e electric charge, they may, for example, be attracted so that A is attracted more to C than to B, and there will be exchange. And that is similar to the double displacement. But all of, all of these displacements, as we're looking at them here, they, um, they play a very important role in the, uh, in the, in the chemical, uh, in the chemical uh, uh, reactions during the roasting. So the, um, uh, here is another way of, uh, of looking at those four uh, different types and the way what plays their role, knowing about what we're trying to do about the molecules, singular or double, or exchanging one with another one requires functions or processes that are known like oxidation and degradation, decompositions, breakdowns, all of that is, is uh, uh, processes that, that take place. Oxidation, remember from chemistry, oxidation is someone that, that basically gives an, an electron and and um, reduction is a component that accepts the electron. Um, these are the these are oxidation processes that we have several of those going on during the roasting and certainly then the degradation, the process by which a, a substance is broken down through either hydrolysis, um, or even oxidation. And then you have the, the, the decomposition of chemical breakdown uh, in the process the effect to, to effect of simplifying a single chemical entity into two or more fragments. Um, I'm pointing these out, these out, out because of there are to, that it's, it's important to understand we're spending on, on these type of reactions in our, in our teaching in our classes here uh, one or two days on, on those functions and taking each and, and every compound apart and defining uh, uh, which one is being uh, processed, uh, which one is uh, uh, being uh, treated or processed uh, to meet any of these four uh, important uh, re uh, reactions. Uh, in, in order to really what we're going towards, understanding all of that, we're now going to really define the components that play a role in the next process. Once we understand the, the chemical reactions, important now is we're going towards the so-called um, uh, 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 mylite reaction. For, to understand the mylite reaction, we need to know about the sugars that play a role, and those are the reducing and non-reducing sugars. And before we do that, let's talk about the aldehydes. It's any class of organic compounds in which a carbon atom shares a double bond with an oxygen atom. And I'm, I'm, I'm really one focus on that. It's the definition of a double bond, as you can see down below, on an, with, an, with an oxygen atom, a single bond with a hydrogen atom, and a single bond with another atom of a group or atoms. The double bond between carbon and oxygen is characteristic of all aldehydes and is known 
acetylcarbonyl group. And as you can see, there's a difference between the aldehyde and, and the, uh, and the uh, ketone. Uh, those are very important uh, structures, formulas, to understand the difference between a reducing and a non-reducing sugar. That brings us to the, to the next. And then we're looking at the most abundant sugar within, within the process is simple sugar, abundantly available, which is the so table sugar, and it is a non-reducing sugar. It is immediately available for, for processing. During roasting, it decomposes by heat uh, and, and treatment application, and the sugar will be dehydrated during the early stages of the roast and, de and then hydrolyzes and into reducing sugars as temperature rises to the pyrolysis point. Now, what's the, what's the, 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 the difference here? If you look at the structure down below, then you see here glucose as a sugar molecule, and you see fructose. Both, both is, is the, 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 the chemical formula and ring of, of sucrose. So there is this connection, which is the glycosidic bond, which is the one here in between. These two legs here, they're so busy, they're holding on to this glycosidic bond and, and they do not have another aldehyde, which would be another electron that they would be able to donate that is not available for them. So it's a non-reducing sugar, which is defined by this glycosidic bond and as, as glucose and fructose combined defining sucrose as sugar that doesn't play a role within the mild reaction, but plays a role in the caramelization. Here's the, 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 the so-called brother, the opposite. Here we have a reducing sugar, which basically shows this leg to hydrogen from the carbon to in a double, in a double uh, connection to oxygen. These are, the, these are the most important structures, and that means they can share, they can donate an electron to, as a reducing agent, to an, an, um, an, an, another molecule. And there's the difference between ketone and aldose, and what it means, I mean, it's coming out of fructose, mannose, and glucose. This sugar, this sugar is a very important sugar. It has a free aldehyde group or con con a ketone functional group, and that plays a role, the major role in the myelite reaction. Now, we need one more component in order to make the myelite reaction working for us, and these are the amino acids. Now, amino acids, they are the building blocks of life. And we have about 20 amino acids, which you see here on the left. 20 of those amino acids are available, um, and they are proteins, and they are ready to inter interface or ready to work with the reducing sugars uh, with the aldehyde group. Both now were taken into the myelite reaction. And here is a more simplified form, and, and I'm working on, on another way of showing this. The myelite reaction is a cascade chemical reaction, and it is not, it's very complicated. It's, also, it's not easy to communicate. Uh, however, in vision, for example, you come now with the reduced sugar and the amino acid sugar, and you put heat on, which you do. In, in the in the in the roaster, we're applying we're applying convective and conductive energy, and we're causing these chemical reactions to happen. We have the, the we have the free water has been evaporated inside the beans. We have temperatures over 100 degrees C and going higher. The pressure builds up. We have substances and organic uh, substances uh, uh, being trans transferred in the mean. That little bean becomes the reactor. Yes, 
we're dissipating, we're allowing being, uh, uh, steam to dissipate. However, it is, it is, it is the, 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 the shell will not give in, but it will basically grow, it will swell in order to make room for the steam and, and certainly the, the reactions to happen, the CO2 to develop, but with the sugar and the amino acids and adding this heat, we're causing all these flavors on the right-hand side. Now, take it like this, for example, you put sugar, in mission, you have down there a conveyor belt, and you put on the conveyor belt in the desert, there's a receiver and you're putting sugar and amino acids and you run in the conveyor belt to an, uh, an, an, an oven. And on the other side, you're rolling out. You're rolling out all these flavors and aromas that you find uh, for sure in our coffee. Uh, when, you, when you grill or barbecue a steak, when you brew beer, when you uh, grill bacon, and certainly anything that is there's heat applied to protein, um, uh, that you know, that you're familiar with is being created. And if you look at down there, you have all those flavor components, the pyrazines that are being developed during this process. So the myelot reaction is, is a non-enzymatic process uh, or browning process. During this entire process, we're creating browning compounds, which are called melanoidines. And they're a reddish brown color that is being created. To, uh, they're created during this process, and it's non enzymatic. It is not like and that means without oxygen. It's not the the same enzymatic process that you are familiar with when you take an apple or you take a, a potato and you cut it in half and you put it on the table and expose it to oxygen and it turns brown. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the browning the non-browning uh, or the, the non-enzymatic browning effect that happens in the roaster with, with uh, no oxygen. In order to complete this, this is only, this is only the browning, the non-enzymatic browning process that we're uh, uh, talking about. We need, um, we need also to understand that on this way, we are going through this phase of the saccharides with the amino compounds, peptides, proteins, from which reactive multifunction intermediate products develop. However, there are intermediate uh, products too, which are the Amadori products through a rearrangement. I'm coming back to the four uh, uh, chemical reactions that have to be understood, but these rearrangement, they're rising other products from decatones, Furanos, furans, and pyrazines, and others. And last but not least, there's also the the the, the Heinz uh, uh, products uh, that are intermediate uh, uh, com compounds um, that develop uh, the flavors and aromas, and at the same time uh, contribute to the uh, 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 change of browning. With the melanoidins, and here you have like this structure that is what we call the the, the cascade structure of the uh, um, flavors and aroma precursors from sugar to amino acids, but it also we're adding trigonoline as the the alkaloid, and we're getting into the chlorogenic acids pretty soon. But all of this is happening during the uh, myelin reaction. One more component that is missing here that is not have not been addressed, that is the so-called striker degradation. What happens here now, we have new products developed within the in the, the myelin reaction, and and the striker degradation is now it involves the amino acids again, but instead reacting with sugar, it's breaking, uh, it's reacting with the molecules of the two carbonyl groups. So the compounds beginning to trade parts among themselves, ketones, which, which create a buttery caramel flavor, key aromas like raspberry and grapefruit. And, and last but not least, the Strecker aldehyde itself. And this is the Strecker degradation 
also yields pyrazines and earthy roasting notes of the coffee aroma. Um, in, in a little bit more of a chemical um, definition, you see it here again with the aldehyde group, the Strecker degradation aldehyde with H2O and with the flavor compounds um, um, that together with the Amador enhanced product uh, provide at the end the, the flavor and aroma that we perceive and appreciate in, the, in, a, in a cup of coffee. Here is the, the amino acids uh, defined that contribute with the Strecker, Strecker uh, aldehyde development to those odor descriptors. The green, an overripe fruit, the malty, the fruity, the to toasted, like toasted bread. And then you see here the relative, I mean, the, the, the relation to the one on the other. Um, and certainly this is information is available that we can share uh, for people that are interested. Uh, to know that. Here, just to reference amino acid, once not used in a Maillard reaction through oxidized, here again, the oxidation process, which basically delivers an, 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 uh, an electron and then, and then the, creates there the aldehydes uh, that we then appreciate and are converted in flavor and aroma compounds. Um, Organic or the organic acids, organic acids, mainly the chlorogenic acids, which is uh, the most important um, uh, acid within the within the organic acids family, and that were listed here: quinic acid, citric acid, malic acid, and so forth. Uh, the the organic acid, the chlorogenic acid, but also citric and malic uh, caffeics, they are all non-volatiles. Now, why do we say that they're all non volatiles Because you're going to find them in the cup. They're going to go through the cup. Thermal decomposition, again, here's the word. We're going to come back to the four most important chemical reactions and a number of factors during the roasting. Roaster type, airflow, we're going to talk that a little bit more later. Um, airflow play an incredible role by um, breaking these these organic acids down to their degree. And there's, there's where roasting, there's where the roast master comes in. There's where the, the, the roaster, the, 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 the performance of the roaster is, is, uh, is uh, uh, shows, would show itself. Um, and I'm not saying one of the roaster type. Yes, there's a difference between a drum roaster and tangential roasters and fluid bed roasters. There's a difference between airflow, high airflow, Low, high airflow, lower temperature, lower airflow, higher temperature, and so forth. But during this process, these organic acids are being, I mean, broken down and degraded. But they leave certain nuances in the cup because they're non-volatile. Citric acid is known for citrus acidic acids, vinegar, malic is the green apple acid, and phosphoric acid, I have to say here, this is not an organic acid, but that contributes to sweetness or a sweeter coffee. And I'm, we're coming back to this too, because phosphoric acid is, an, is a very interesting uh, component. If you like to go more into the, into the chemical structures of those, and you're looking at chlorogenic acid, which is breaking down during the process into quinic acid, uh, through heat and into caffeic acid. Um, and then we're looking at all of them. Where are they, where, in, in more details, where do these acidic, acidic uh, uh, or acids playing a role? In, in what of these categories are they playing a role? Now, for here, sour, chlorogenic acid. If it breaks down in quinic and caffeic acid. Now, if we're not, if we're running too fast in the roasting profile, while we're going up to the first crack and we're running through fast to this moment where we're breaking down chlorogenic acid into quinic and, and, and uh, caffeic acid, then our 
our cup is basically coming out a little bit too sour because we're leaving more more acidity back, the chlorogenic acidity in the coffee cup. So that's a it's a trick to 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 run through this moment to this place, depending on the different coffees you're roasting or processing. It is a trick to how do we ideally and best convert the 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 uh, chlorogenic acid in the quinic acid. Quinic acid is more stable, and and I'm sure everybody of us has has experienced that that when a late afternoon we're walking into a coffee shop, and there's a coffee pot sitting uh, on a coffee hot coffee plate, and what are we getting? What what is the perception that we're getting when we're when we first of all there's a sour taste, that is for example, if if you will, I mean this is quinic acid that basically that's for coffee that sits there for so long. But that sensation is basically the, uh, the, the, the quinic acid. And here, again, lactic acid that, we, that is being uh, uh, created and, and, and generated, but also degraded quinic acid, the acid of cranberry, citric acid of, of, of citrus, uh, the acid of uh, the, the vinegar, the acidic acid is, is created during uh, the, the process, the, the roasting process. However, it's coming from the fermentation process uh, and, and, and then it's being created during the roasting process. Caffeic acid we talked about and malic acid, the acid of the apple uh, uh, as well. And here is how they, uh, what we know, how they, how they basically degrade during the roasting process in, in, in those crafts. They're built up at the time to a certain point and then they're being degraded. The same thing with the citric acid. Here's the development of acidic acid that comes with it, comes already with the coffee, is being created, and at any point in time, uh, it is uh, has a have a very strong note, but it's also de uh, uh, create, uh, uh, degraded. Trigonolin, that's the process of trigonolin as an alkaloid. Um, the longer the roast, um, the more it is being broken down. Um, here we have the trigonolin in pyridines and the nicotinic acid, which is a, a positive uh, uh, from a health point of view, uh, has a positive impact um, um, uh, in, in, in the coffee. And then, and then again, where do these flavor compounds in aromas, where do they land uh, within in these taste profiles? And, and how do we do this? As cuppers, we're trying to find out what are we perceiving by elimination? Um, by elimination, and when we and we go to the, the uh, trigonoline as an alkaloid, obviously the bitterness, and that also includes the the, the caffeine. They contribute to the bitterness um, uh, perception um, when cupping a, a cup of coffee. And again, it is up to the cupper to determine what type of bitterness are we picking up. In this, in this, in this, uh, in, in this, in a, in a cup of coffee, uh, here is caffeine, not spe specifically uh, pointed out in in, in the segment, uh, but um, very important uh, to understand. Now, here we just as a summary: caffeine as the alkaloid with intense bitter taste defense me mechanism, taste compounds is bitter and sour. The forbid the caffeine can contribute about 30% responsible for, uh, and the rest is caused by the products in the myelite reaction. That's where bitterness is coming from. Sour is coming from acidic or citrus, malic, phosphoric responsibility. The volatiles, I mean, obviously, what gives aroma and flavor formed and, and, and retained in the, in, the, in, the, in the cell structure, they're mostly aldehydes and ketones from protein an important amount of sulfides from certain proteins. Volatile substances, it's, it's, uh, they're vaporized. They have higher vapor pressure at room temperatures. Um, we, we, the pyrolysis, we, we basically skipped this here for a bit and we, we're going to come back to, to this uh, as much as the caramelization. Uh, we'll see that later. When we do the roast, when we're roasting a cup of coffee, what we're teaching um, in, in, in our roasting uh, classes is here what we're roasting um, is, is um, 
uh, the, the, the specialty curve, which basically uh, takes uh, from the charging temperature, the, the rate of rise, the turning point, the first crack, the development time, uh, all of those are the midpoint time. All of these are uh, 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 parameters that we're roasting and, and we um, talking about, and as a summarize, what we have done so far with creating those 800 to 1000 different aroma compounds, uh, we're creating the mylar reaction, the Strecker degradation, the amino acid breakdown, the degradation of trigonomin, the, the uh, degradation of the chlorogenic acid, the phenols, ox oxidation of lipids, and the interaction of all of the above. This is what we have touched so far. Um, um, I'm seeing the, the time, but I need to point out uh, a little bit more for where we're going. Everything, everything that has been discussed right now, with all developing these, these flavors and aromas, what you see there in front of it is, is, a, is an, a summary of what happens during the roast. Now, during the first time, we're talking about an endothermic phase. We're coming around to turning point. We endothermic means we're adding heat energy into the coffee. This is the drying phase. This is so important to know the, finding the right ratio between convection and conductive. The more convection, the faster you're drying out the bean, the faster you're running through the chemical reactions. You need to have that right ratio between conductive and convection uh, ratio in order to do, to do the right thing. Now, what happens to it first in the first 260? The sucrose, the 70%, begins to degrade rapidly, decompose. And in light roast, 90% is lost. First through dehydration and followed by hydrolyzation and reducing to the reducing sugars. You make to the next step, you get to the, to refer to the 309, uh, 309 degrees F where the mylar reaction starts. It's not worth finished, where it starts. It causes free proteins to continue with reducing sugars to form the uh, hundreds of aromatic com compounds such as furans and sweet caramel notes. We're growing on 320, caramelization starts. More tightly, the water is driven off. Trigonolin decomposes, including or formation of CO2, H2, and large class of arom aromatic compounds called the pyridines. We're going on to 130 or for 335. Free water evaporates. Loose chaff is coming off. Loss, the, the loss of organic matter, such as the carbon monoxide and, and carbon dioxide is lost first, and coffee begins to yellow. 356, pyrolysis started. Here's this pyrolysis. This is now pyrolysis. We're, we're taking something down by, by temperature. We're breaking uh, substances down, chemical reactions down by temperature. 380. The first pop, of course, could be 390. The first pop, depending on the coffee, pyrolysis has begun. Beans pass through the class trans, uh, transition temperature. That's a very important, I mean, transition takes a little bit longer to explain, but water, CO, and CO2 causing the first pop. Most water is gone. Caffeine begins to sublime from roasting bean. Volume doubles in size. This is where now the swelling starts and uh, and the uh, and, and the, the, easily the, the bean becomes a double in size. 410 coffee burns become exotherm. Pyrolysis is in full swing. VOCs, volatile organic compounds, are emanating from coffee. Blue gray haze appears. Proteins are being consumed and denatured in the myelite reactions. Sugars are being consumed. The larger pyrolysis, the longer the pyrolysis is allowed to go, fraction in the bean cell wall and larger pores allow. Now what we had at the beginning, go back to the to, to the to polysaccharides, which basically contribute to the bean itself, to making it this converter that holds the pressure, we, which is a very organized structure. Now when we're done, this, this structure is porous, um, 
water has been taken out, oils are moving around, cavities have been created and are now filled with CO2. And we know we're building up the pressure and this pressure that can be easily go to like eight atmosphere. Not that we're able to measure that with a gauge. No, we know how much, uh, what, uh, how much uh, uh, the substances are being converted into carbon monoxide and creating this pressure inside the bean. And, that's, and, and we go on. We go on. 410 cellulose breaks down apart and reacts with protein parts from humic acid. Pyrolysis or chemical decomposition of sucrose from aldehydes are also appealing. Aromas, flavor, development depend on how the pyrolysis is allowed to go to proceed. Now, you're by way now and are doing that roast in the exothermic uh, phase of the, of, of, this, uh, of the roasting process. Carbon dioxide gas, gases, aldehydes, ketones, acidic acid, which are volatilized from the beans at that time. And then quinic and caffeic acid occur around the first pop when the beans undergo the physical uh, change. Citric acid is not created during the roasting, but slowly decomposes over the time um, and so forth. Important is that once you reach this point, this is, this is here the aroma development. This is the development phase in the exotherm phase. At, but at the same time, as long as the roast goes, the longer the roast goes, the lower the acidity, but the higher the bitterness. That's important to understand for, for roast in particular, for people that get into the roasting business, um, um, that, that is very, a very important development. Now, and look at the entire roasted coffee chemistry, the aromatic com compounds. Here's the green beans with its total of 100%, 26% becomes soluble. The majority of the soluble stuff is also, is basically what you find as ground coffee uh, from the cellular structure of the beans. But look at the impact of the non-volatile acids, which are basically ending up in the cup and, and, and the organic acids and, and certainly the alkaloids, relatively low comparing to what we begin with and, and, and what impact they have on, on the quality of the cup. Now, we have here... Uh, uh, we have here the, the, the pH. I'm just making reference to the to pH, which is the power of hydrogen, because that's the way we're measuring the acidity. Because when we go into, into cupping, and, and, and we know the darker we roast, the sweeter the coffee. But when we're really looking for something very special in the, in a, in the lighter or medium roast, we're looking for the clean acidity in the cup. Now we have all of, of those various acidities uh, that, um, that, we, that we have talked about. Citric acid, chlorogenic acid, malic acid, acidic acid, caffeic acid, quinic acid. We have all of them. It's, not, it's impossible for us to pick any of them particularly. We can only get a sensation of all of them. And then, and then we can, in a way of determine if what the what the acidity is, how the, the, the fruitiness is, and and the sweetness and the bitterness is, but there is one one very important ma mathematical term that we need to know, which is or we need to define, which is the pKa. Now the pKa mathematically is is a is a, is a uh, definition of the ne negative logarithm. I'm not going to go into this, but we're looking at the key PA as a component in measuring, and that tells us what the acidity in a coffee solution, in a coffee cup, has to be in order to emphasize the one or other acidities that we have developed during the roast. And it came to find out that if you look at the, K, the PKA factors on, on this chart, um, the lower the chart, the lower this PKA factor, the higher it, it is. See it as an, a disassociate uh, factor. But the lower this factor is, the higher the emphasis, the higher the strength of this acidity being recognized 
in, in this cup of coffee. And you go through all of them, quinic acid, 353, lactic acid, citric acid, acetic acid, malic acid. The lowest is phosphoric acid. And phosphoric acid is not something that we, um, that, that, that is, it's not an organic acid. It's something that comes out of the soil. And we came to find out that you're really in a cup of coffee, if you want to put the sparkle into the cup of this nice, beautiful, I call it the Pinot Grigio acidity. You got to have that phosphoric acid. I mean, in a way developed so that you can pick it up in your cup of coffee. That is, this is a very important mathematical term to be, look, to be looked at in order to measure the strength of, of acidity. And at the same time, what the strength has to be in order to make it a sparkle cup of coffee. So finally, we, we, we have several flavor forming substances that are presented from the beginning. We added heat to them, and we're gonna get a certain development of, of substances out of them. And if we go back here, then you see this out of the green bean, what we were able to do and adding the minerals. We haven't done a whole lot to the minerals. Caffeine, we haven't done a lot to that. Free amino acids we took care of pretty well. Aroma that we converted and created. Simple sugars that we converted. The organic acids that we, yeah, I mean, use pretty well. Chlorogenic acids for sure. Arabinogalactan, which came out of the carbohydrates we used and converted. Manan, another one out of the out of the uh, um, out of the carbohydrates, and then the browning effect. And we all know myelite reaction. We all know where it came from. The proteins, and last but not least, the cellulose, uh, lignin, and oils. And we haven't done a whole lot to that. But this is what we converted during the roasting process. And in, in the summary, here we have green coffee in the bar craft. And you can see basically what we created with, acidity, with various organic acidities, but including the phosphoric acid as well. And this in comparison to numbers that has been created um, by Dr. Illy many, many years ago. And we have the, the we know when we don't want uh, coffee with a higher acidity, we have to roast slower because we want to carry a little bit more uh, of the chlorogenic acid over the aroma of the flavors, which is the blue line here. It's got to be a little bit slower body, a little bit longer and dark roast and flavor, certainly longer as well. And I talked earlier about when we looked at the, the structure of the beans, the green beans as a, as a uh, very f uh, organized structure in its cell structure um, uh, to the point of acting as a converter uh, in this process. And when we're done with everything, that's what you're looking at. Those cavity that we've created that are filled with gas or CO2 the water that has been replaced, the, the oil that we moved around, all of that is what is what is basically when we're cutting to the bean at the end after roasting, and that's left. A bean, a bean, a roasted bean with a pressure inside of can go basically up to 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 over 10, 12 bar or atmosphere. Um, and if you're grinding it, if you take this. When you take this coffee and you put it on the on the table and, and you let it sit there and exposed to to the atmospheric oxygen, it will take about it will take about 21 days until that pressure inside the bean has reached equilibrium to the outside atmosphere. Now, if you take that same coffee and you cut it down and you grind it down and you put it down on on the on the table, it will be reaching that same equilibrium within six hours. So uh, because of the higher uh, for surface area, but each and every particle in the, in the particles uh, size distribution when you're grinding it still holds that much pressure. It's just the surface areas has increased and 
and um, the, 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 the coffee can be gassing faster. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Carl. That was amazing. And my mind hurts a little bit. Um, and I don't, you probably haven't been able to see the comments, but everyone is loving the job that you've done. Fantastic. Thank you. Amazing. Um, mind blown. Anyway, great job, Carl. Uh, we do have some questions. We have a little bit of time for questions. Um, let's see. Well, there was one really early question. Um, someone asked if you could explain a little bit more about the inside of the seed and where the term mucilage comes from. Oh, on the on the green coffee side, if I'm not that I wanted to 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 uh, dodge the bullet here, but 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 the uh, Mike has has an um, a, a particular talks about the. Uh, the, the, the mucilage and the um, and the, uh, the the structure the agricultural part of the bean itself so there, there is there's an, 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 a presentation coming with, with reference to that but it is uh, the, the the mucilage is basically that forms um, on the bean um, after the um, the uh, picking process uh, before the fermenting it's the it's the the uh, uh, the outside uh, um, uh, for the lack of another word, but it is a, 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 a layer of a waxy layer that is basically used and, and fermented uh, in the fermentation process after <laughs> after the, uh, the, the post-picking process. Again, Mike has this green coffee uh, part <laughs> uh, separated for that. Great. Um and then this question, Mike answered it really briefly, but I think you could probably go into a little more detail. Is the longer the roast, the more acidic and less bitter? And how is that in comparison to quicker roasts? Yeah, so the longer the, longer the roast, um, the, we're saying the longer the roast, the sweeter the roast. But the longer the roast, the longer you roast the coffee, all the organic acidities, and in particular the, the chlorogenic acid, has been totally um, degraded, decomposed, split into quinic and to caffeic acid. And the longer you roast, that, that, that acidity is gone. But at the same time, if you go shorter roast, like if you, let's say, you, let, let's say a long roast is 12 minutes, and in, 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 in a short roast, the high yield roast is six minutes, you will basically not degrade all the chlorogenic acid. There is a way of, there's a purpose behind that you're roasting faster because you want a more acidic, in, in particular, Europeans love a, a, more, a more acidic type of roast, uh, which basically is a shorter roast and subsequently retains more, uh, more uh, chlorogenic acid and, and breaks less down to the quinic and, and caffeic acid. That is when you go short roast, but the sh the shorter the roast, the higher the is the the acidic acid the the acids in there. The longer you roast, the more you basically degrade them, but at the same time the bitterness goes up because you get into you allow the the pyrolysis to go on and you get into the cell structure of the beans and the spiciness and all kinds of other bitter components com compounds will basically overtake um, uh, this uh, the, 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 the uh, cupping sensation. Okay. Um, there were a couple more um, comments in the chat window, and I think Mike will cover these, but let's just make sure. Could you please give us an example of parchment pulp dried fruit dried coffee and seed dried coffee? Okay. Uh, I think Mike will cover that. Yes. 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 He has that. Uh, 
He's, uh, I mean, I'm going to get beaten up by him if I'm taking that because. Yeah. He has- <laughs> All right. Um, and then this one, I think it, Mike will, might touch on this, but I just want to read this question because I think it's a good one. Is wash coffee more porous than natural processed if it comes from the same farm, the same variety? Is, is wash coffee more what? Porous. Yes. But yes. But again, it's a subject that we wanted to keep separate from, from the chemical aspect of it. Sorry when I'm, that is what, what Mike is basically focusing on. All right. Well, we have reached the official end of your time. And I know we'll see you again later today. So if yeah. anyone has any more questions for Carl, please put them in the Q&A. Yes. Carl, thank you so much. Um, as always, your insight into the chemistry of coffee is just, it's mind blowing, really. Thank you very much for breaking it down for us all. And I know everybody's dying to rewatch it. Someone even said they want to watch it a hundred times. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Carl, you can turn off your camera. All right. Our next session is The Power of Farming Success by Phyllis Johnson. Phyllis Johnson is the co-founder and president of BD Imports, an award-winning green coffee importing company focused on the responsible sourcing of specialty coffees. Phyllis is a true pioneer in the women in coffee movement with over two decades of experience. She led the formation of the International Women's Coffee Alliance chapters in East Africa and led initiatives around the globe, helping to ensure that women are acknowledged and paid for their work. In 2020, she founded the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity, a nonprofit that seeks to build racial equity in the coffee industry. Phyllis holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Microbiology from the University of Arkansas and a master's in public administration degree from Harvard Kennedy School. Hello, Phyllis. Hey, Connie, hey, y'all. It's so good to see you. Uh, let me straighten my camera a little bit. I there you to... are. Not Hello. Everybody. Wow. Hello, good to see you too. It's great to see you. I've been sitting here just absorbing all this good information shared today. Wow, Carl, it was just like being in chemistry class again. You're right. Yes, totally. I'm going to sign off and let you take it away. Sure. Let me share my screen and get going. So, yeah, I want to thank the organizers of the event. I know that this sort of thing is not very easy to put on, but uh, very thankful for those of you who've decided to allow us to spend time with you today. Um, You know, the pandemic has really uh, given me a greater appreciation for craft roasters. So if you're a craft roaster out there, thank you for helping to get us through this pandemic. I must have tried at least uh, 30, 40 different brands over the last year that I probably would not have tried. And I think you guys are really the reason why um, consumers love and enjoy coffee. So today I'm gonna talk about the power of farming success. And so for the past 20 years that I've spent in coffee, I've spent a lot of time talking about race and gender and economic disparities of coffee farmers. But what I don't always talk about is that for five years of a very young life, I spent at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. And when I was done, they gave me, I I will say that I earned a degree in microbiology as a first uh, generation college student studying such a hard science. It wasn't easy. So 10 years after that, I spent working in laboratories and uh, working in sales and marketing for science companies. When I was approached to speak to you guys about um, this idea of fermentation, um, I actually had to be a little coaxed into it. Um, And I thought, you know, I I guess I can probably talk about this. So today we're gonna talk about coffee fermentation. I'm not gonna get quite as technical as Carl, you know, for a couple reasons. Um, 
But I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about fermentation. I'm going to introduce you to an incredible Brazilian family um, that is using fermentation to uh, gain recognition in the, in the industry. And I'm going to talk about the organization that I founded, the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. So as I started to dust off my old college microbiology book, and yes, I still have it, I keep it as a badge of honor. In the first pages, I noticed how um, they wanted to talk about, you know, how the whole idea of microbiology began. And I realized that the advancements in life and in science, they all evolve simply because of our curiosity. I noticed in the chat, many of you were saying, boy, I wish I had paid more attention in, in chemistry class. But it's curiosity that leads us to discoveries. And, and I think that once coffee gives all of us a great, great sense of curiosity, there's so much to discover. Um, as Carl was going through the temperature ramp, I could just see the bean. I'm sure you guys could too. You could see it heating up. You could see, you know, the chemical reactions changing and getting that final product. So just this curiosity that we all hold is so near and dear. So as I was kind of starting to fumble through my, my old college book and I saw the name Anton Van Leeuwen Hook, um, Anton, let me tell you about him. Now, Anton was a draper and a haberdasher, and I'm sure most of you don't know what a haberdasher is, but that's someone who sells uh, small items that are used to sew, sew material, make things. He was also a town wine taster. He was the official town wine taster. And so in 1590, um, this man from Holland created what was called a known as the first microscope. But as a wine taster, what he did was he took the glass from the wine and he ground them up and he started to look through the glass and he saw these things underneath the glass. And he, he described them as miniature beast or he described, described them as um, amicals, uh, small animal, animals. Um, he thought, he looked at rainwater, he looked at soil, he looked at, you know, all different types of media to find these small things under the what he had created was a microscope. Um, he even scraped his teeth and he saw these squiggly things uh, under the microscope. It wasn't until the 1880s that Louis Matt, uh, Pasteur, a French uh, scientist, gained all the credit for saying, yes, fermentation exists. Uh, it's caused by microorganisms. And he dispelled this whole idea of spontaneous generation. Um, this idea of spontaneous generation, meaning that, you know, a, a, a bag of, of dirty towels can generate uh, mice or roaches or something like that, that life actually comes from life. But it was Lewin Hook who actually saw microbes for the first time. And again, what I, what I, the point I'd like to make about that is curiosity. And, I, and I'm sure many of you who are roasters and watching today, you may not understand the chemistry behind uh, coffee, the makeup of coffee, but you understand what you're doing and you're curious. So De Diego is my, my friend today. I'm gonna tell you about his, he, him and his family. Diego, is uh, from a coffee farming family in the south of Minas Gerais. Um, he, along with his father and uh, mother, are working to create coffee, uh, produce coffee that gain recognition on um, the cupping table. So when you look at fermentation, two things must be present with fermentation. Microbes, you need microbes. Um, and you need a, a reduced oxygen vessel. You need a place where there's more interaction that what is naturally there can continue to grow and take form and take shape. And so, as you can see the blue vessel, the blue uh, jug that Diego is standing beside, is what they use for fermentation. Um, 
There's over 50 species of microorganisms that are classified as yeast um, and bacteria are present in coffee fermentation. If we think about coffee, um, coffee as we know it today could not exist without fermentation. The process of going from a cherry on a tree to a beverage in your cup could not happen without fermentation. Um, so there are two primary uh, types of processing. Uh, I think Mike is gonna tell you about uh, different, more than two kinds, but there's two major kinds and it's washed and natural. If For those of you who've had the chance to travel to coffee producing countries, you've seen the big washing tanks, you've seen the coffee sitting there in the washing tanks for 24 to 48 hours fermenting. Um, also the mucilages coming off the coffee. The coffee is, is the intent is for the coffee to, be get, to become sweeter. If you've seen the dried cherries roasting on the patios in different countries, be it Africa or Latin America, you've seen the coffee cherries laying there. It's the sun that's helping the fermentation and the fermentation is happening between the pulp and the green coffee underneath. So, but there's something else. There's a different kind of fermentation uh, or an additional fermentation, I'll say. It's known as post-harvest fermentation or anaerobic fermentation. And the reason why this fermentation is important is because it allows an opportunity to produce specialty coffee. I mean, can you imagine producing coffee in a country the size of Brazil? You know, the vast amount of land, the vast amount of farmers, the size of the farmers, the diversity in what different farmers have, the tools in which they have to farm. Well, the, the Homeros family, they produce about 100, 120 bags of coffee a year. They farm on about five hectares of land with 15,000 trees. How can they gain recognition? How can their coffee stand out on the table? Well, the goal is to is for anaerobic fermentation is to take the flavors that exist in coffee, the flavors that you smell in, in the cherry, the, the flavors from the, the flowering plants and to bring that all into the green bean. So that when buyers, when importers, when buyers, cuppers are at the table, they can take notice of something that's quite unique. Um, when Carl was talking about uh, the, the darker the roast, the sweeter the, the coffee, this whole uh, saying came back to me, the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. Um, and that's from the producer's perspective. And it's one thing to produce the best coffee you can, but how can you give that coffee a bit of an edge? I wanna add a note that Dr. Lucas Lozada, he's head of the coffee research analysis at the Federal Institute of Espirito Santos, Brazil. And I'm, we have a video, uh, I'm not gonna show that video, it's gonna be made available to you. And he talks about uh, fermentation and how fermentation is so important in a country like Brazil, how it changes the physical condition of the bean. You heard Carl talk a lot about the physicality of coffee beans. Fermentation changes that and hopefully changes it for the better. Um, he challenges that roasters from the roaster to the, the barista should all get involved in understanding fermentation because that change has an impact on how the coffee is produced, how the coffee is, is roasted, how the coffee is brewed, how the coffee is stored, all aspects of the coffee change. He talks about how um, yeast is, is added to low altitude um, productions for fermentation. Um, in the uh, Romero's uh, situation, they don't add yeast. Um, I'm going to show a film, a video at the end, and you'll see that they use more of a natural process for fermentation. Roasters can be a little bit uh, indecisive about fermented uh, coffee or uh, anaerobic fermented coffee. Um, as you can see, I put up um, 
I wanted the Romero's coffee. Um, it came in as a pre-shipment sample and the roaster said it's plum, wine, boozy, strawberry, almond. One cup had a little taint, a little phenolic. So he didn't score quite as high. He scored at 85, but then said, if there's, there might be a problem here. But when the actual coffee um, that was shipping, the pre-shipment sample came in, um, he loved it. He scored it much higher and uh, he does a UV uh, analysis on the, on the coffee to show that any, any spoil or over fermented um, beans would show up. And he thought that this coffee was among the best. Edelaine, Edelaine is the woman involved in all of this. And she's engaged in the sample roasting. Um, she cups the coffee. Her explanation of as to how fermented coffee taste is that it's, it's, it tastes brighter. It's sugar cane, molasses, brown sugar. Um, it roasts faster. Uh, so these are things that they know uh, will change the structure and the taste of the coffee. Um, but at the same time, they still feel that it's a risk. Um, anytime you start to change the what nature normally provides to something else, there's always that risk. Uh, because there is a lot of um, science behind it, right? Um, so they're very aware that there are risks involved. Um, my friend KJ uh, Young got a chance to create the video that I'm going to show you and had a chance to have a conversation uh, with the family. And he asked Edelaine um, about her role. And she explained all that she had to do um, on the farm and in the family life. And she said, you know, if women could be more as valuable as much as men doing the same work, that's what I would like to see. So again, you know, we always like to understand the challenges as you are coffee roasters, as you are coffee importers, coffee consumers. Um, let's all look at the challenges that people that are engaged in this industry face. I had a chance to read in my research uh, about fermentation, a really good article by 25 Magazine, The Fermentation Effect. Um, Sophia Zhang and Floric Braun, uh, they wrote a really nice paper on fermentation uh, for the industry in more layman's terms. And they talked about how the actual coffee varietal, uh, the length of time in the fermentation, all of that has an impact on the flavor. So I advise you to go ahead and if you um, and look up this article as well. But there was one statement that, uh, one quote at the end of um, the article that I enjoyed. It said, we believe that this diversity is coffee strength because it means that there is a vast amount of pre-mutations of the factors above that remain to be explored and that this diversity in the coffee value chain interweaves craft and science. We, we remain convinced that some of the outcomes are bound to result in a damn fine cup of coffee. So basically, even in fermentation, researchers said they stand behind the diversity that fermentation can bring to our industry and can set aside coffees from small scale farmers like the ones that I'm talking about today. Again, I wanna get back to curiosity, right? And I think that that's, that's really why we're all here. And in my 20 years of working in coffee, I, I've been curious about a lot of things. I've been curious, not just about the bean, not about just about the flavor notes and you know the different origins that I've studied, um, the places I've gone, the people. I've been curious about the lack of participation by everyone. I've been curious why I've been one of few black women in the green coffee trade. And I was really 
happy when I was invited to have this conversation with you today, because as you can imagine, as one of few Black women in this role, I'm often asked to speak about that identity. And it gets, that identity can supersede my knowledge and interest on other things, um, like the ability to understand the science behind coffee or talk about the science behind coffee. So it was my curiosity that led me to a question about the relationship and understanding of blackness and coffee and the void that I saw in the rooms in which I, I was able to, to, to sit in. And uh, I had a wonderful opportunity uh, last year during the pandemic to work alongside Connie and Roast to produce my first book, Triumph, Black Brazilians and Coffee. You see, my curiosity was that I had understood Brazil's history in coffee. I had understood the history in general of coffee and the enslavement of people. And my question was, where are they? Where are they today? They, there are descendants. I am a descendant of Blacks in America who worked in cotton. Where are the descendants today of Blacks who worked in Brazil? So I wrote this book about two families that produce some amazing coffees. Um, I think you will get a chance uh, to taste them at the lab. I think Mike is uh, cupping them with the panel today. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where my curiosity led me. My curiosity also led me to form an organization during the pandemic called the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity. And it says on our website that our strength is in diversity. We recognize that race is a part of our life experiences and affects our individual perspective. Coffee companies and employees benefit from the participation of the whole society, both in employment and consumption. And there, there is much more to explore and experience with the diverse voices and participation. So the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity, our goal is to build greater racial diversity in the coffee industry. It is our goal to do, do this so that we have more, we have a chance at more solutions, right? Because different people bring different solutions, different ideas to the table. So that's my, that's my pitch on uh, the social issues. I, you know, it's always, it's always about the people um, in coffee for me, be it understanding the dynamics of gender equity, um, racial equity, and where those intersect is an enormous uh, space of curiosity. And I invite you to, to enter that space of curiosity. Um, so I wanna, I wanna say thank you for your time at this point. Um, thank you for showing up for this discussion. Thank you for hearing fermentation light because uh, my, micro de my micro degree is a little old, but I, I understood what Carl was talking about and uh, gr to a great degree. So I want to thank you for that, but I, I, I want to end with showing you a video um, that I think that you'll get a lot out of, and uh, I hope you enjoy it.
desde aos sete anos de idade, eu já trabalhava com meu pai na, nas lavouras de café. E com o passar do tempo, vimos embora para a cidade. Tive que aprender a trabalhar de pedreiro para me sobreviver. E fui premiado logo mais à frente, em dinheiro, e resolvemos comprar essa propriedade aqui, e há, há oito anos atrás. Logo em seguida, plantamos o nosso primeiro café. Depois do passar do tempo, há uns três anos atrás, aprendemos a trabalhar, construir o um café especial, onde aprendemos a trabalhar com ele. E estamos hoje aí dando sequência no nosso trabalho. Nós aprendemos a fazer a fermentação por uma curiosidade do meu pai. Sempre, foi, sempre gostou de estar aprendendo, de estar desenvolvendo novas maneiras de nosso trabalho. E ele começou a procurar na internet muitos vídeos, no YouTube. O processo começa na lavoura com a seleção dos grãos cereja, depois da lavoura trazemos ele para o terreiro, onde nós fazemos a lavagem de café, levamos para o terreiro para fazer uma pré-seleção dos grãos, e é para separar os grãos cereja, que são os que vão para a fermentação. Café significa muita coisa na nossa vida. Hoje, tudo que nós temos aqui é através do café. É, nós chegamos aqui não tinha nada, foi tudo assim, um trabalho nosso, toda construção toda nossa, assim, então foi bastante coisa já, graças a Deus, com tão pouco tempo, nós já conquistamos muito com o café. Meu maior sonho é construir uma casa muito boa aqui para nós, é, para poder receber as visitas, o pessoal que vem de fora, fazer até mesmo provar um café, comprar o nosso café, que é o que vai estar ajudando a nossa vida daqui para frente. Assim, agregar o, o, o valor do trabalho que não é preciso dentro do sítio em vida. Okay, so that's my presentation and uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. I don't wanna stand between you and lunch today. I know lunch is after my presentation, so there you go. Actually, Phyllis, I have a couple questions. I didn't see any for you directly in the chat right now, but but I have a couple. Sure. Um, I, I think you touch on this question in, in the, the Triumph book, but I was wondering how you met the farmers that you worked with in Brazil and how did that relationship grow to what it is today? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I started going to Brazil, um, I think 2015. Um, I was invited to just go and visit some farmers, some women who were starting the Women in Coffee chapter there. And um, it was years over 2015, 2016, 2017, I kept going back. And I had an interest, a specific interest in understanding and meeting black farmers. And uh, my friend Miriam, who owns Fazenda Cachoeira, um, introduced me to some farmers in her region. And that's how it kind of got started. And then we started to meet more farmers. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's been just a long process over time. Um, my next question is sort of along those lines too. I would love to see if you could share some ideas of how other people could be more involved. And um, you mentioned curiosity. So how do you think we, sh we could be more curious? Well, you know how, you know how exciting it was to hear about the science of coffee and to hear, you know, you know, just what happens, you know, because science is kind of like unlocking things that we kind of don't fully understand, but then there's an explanation behind it. 
Um, and that's what science is. And I feel as though uh, we've learned to not be curious about certain things that we may see as being challenging or something that is um, not you know, well received, but we really have to understand that there are different stories, there are different perspectives, um, there are different realities. And it's important for us to maintain the same level of curiosity about the science of coffee as we do about the, the social aspects of coffee. You know, I know that we're each trying to um, operate businesses. You know, I was sitting there watching Carl and I thought, you know, this guy, he's, isn't he running a coffee roasting company? And he's like, he's like my chemistry teacher right now. And that's really cool. We have more than enough things to do. But I think that if we start to see ourselves as being part of change, even in the little things that we do, even in the decisions that we make, and, and I, Rick Reinhardt talked about this earlier, um, about how the millennials uh, are now getting to a stage to where th things matter. So sustainability is, is really in the forefront, you know, how, you know, the conditions of where life is, when the environment, when, where products are purchased. So we're in a moment where we are starting to evaluate our decisions and we're starting to say no matter what, that, you know, I have some power. And I think that that's pretty amazing. I think we start to get frustrated um, about, some social issues because we feel powerless. But I can tell you, you know, I grew up on a farm in Arkansas. And if someone like me can lead change in East Africa, you can do it too. I mean, I grew up chopping cotton. I, I don't hold any, you know, extra power. I just hold a desire and curiosity. So I think that for my message is to be curious because once you're curious, even about the things you don't understand, about the things that you you may not even believe, but if you're curious about it, it opens up your mind to see a pathway to do something about it. Nice, inspiring as always. We have a question. Uh, how can we best share the story of race and gender equality of farmers and coffee workers without without communities. Is it enough to simply buy coffees intentionally? It seems like there needs to be more. Um, you know, I think if it starts with calling it out, you know, it starts with calling it out. Oftentimes we try and to become educated about it. Um, we work in a global industry. And so this whole idea of racial equity in a global industry can get really, really clouded. Um, and we start to confuse these ideas that, well, you know, I work with people from Latin America, I work with people from Africa, but within each of these environments and within each of these countries, just like within our own, there are people at different levels. There are people with different levels of opportunity and access to, to opportunities. And so I think that as we start to consider our, you know, our actions, we have to consider that the environment in which we live in is replicated all over the world. It, it is a replication. It's just different kinds of people. It's just, they, they might not be European white Americans. They might not be, you know, they might be more European, you know, Latin American, but where are the indigenous people? Are you trading with indigenous people? What? And I think we have to first come to the understanding of that uh, instead of, I could have easily said, well, Brazilians are Brazilian. They're just all Brazilian and they are, but there's, there's also a, a racist there. And, and there was also a race of people that I never saw in, in spaces where I was. So I think talking about it, making it not so uncomfortable, 
but being very intentional about it because um, as you can see, Luis has ideas, he has dreams. I've been to some coffee spaces and you know, stayed on, you know, beautiful farms where, you know, as a buyer, you can come in and experience all of this. His dream is to one day have this. And you can see that his race doesn't preclude him from having the passion and desires and interest in being a part of building solutions to the industry. That does not preclude him. But if he's not in the circle, if he doesn't have an opportunity to trade in the international market, to build his business, to grow, to learn, that he's stifled. And we miss out on those opportunities. So I think that for us to understand, it's what we're missing as an industry, more so than looking at it from the perspective of trying to help someone. Well, you always inspire me to be better and to be more curious for sure. I will remember that word going forward. Um, and I always say, and I, there are a lot of people in the comments saying the same thing. I always say, I want to be Phyllis when I grow up. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. it. It's uh, I, I'm honored to be in this industry. I've been, I talk a lot about race and gender, Connie, but I have been welcomed with open arms. I've been loved. I've been invited. And uh, for that, I am so grateful. And that is what makes me want to um, fight for room for others because I know what it is and I know how great it is. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like the industry has been the same to me too. Mm -hmm. I feel loved and invited as well. Yes. Uh, we have another question. Sure. Uh, love your passion, Phyllis, and I would love to talk with you about what you're doing in Ethiopia, particularly mm -hmm. all our women co-ops. The Is women, it, go ahead. Particularly all of our women co-ops. Chris Rampin? Oh, oh, Buna, the soul of coffee. Um, Are you working there? No, uh, I've done work in Ethiopia. I've worked with the women in Ethiopia. Um, and, you know, it's, it's truly amazing. Ethiopia has some challenges at the moment. Um, but at the same time, it, Ethiopia always rises to the top and carries, you know, carries the, the banner of being the birthplace of coffee. Um, you know, the women there are incredible. Uh, they do a lot of work, an incredible amount of work, and they are responsible for the coffee quality that we have in our cup, for the coffees that you love and adore. It's, it's those thousands and thousands of women you see piling into those um, places for selection, you know, hand selecting, you know, on a conveyor belt, if you can imagine this mind-blowing. It's just the work that's done there, the attention to quality is truly, truly amazing. And often we talk about specialty coffee as being coffees that are washed, but for those who really love Ethiopian coffees, Ethiopia showed us a long time ago that you didn't have to have a specialty coffee. Uh, you didn't have to have a coffee wash to call it specialty coffee. Um, their coffees are very nice and very distinct. So um, yeah, Ethiopia is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I would like to do more in Ethiopia as, you know, time goes on, but um, it's also time for the next generation, Connie, you know, it's time for the next generation, new ideas. For sure. I, I look forward to seeing, you know, who the next generation of leaders is. Yeah, it's um, It's been so nice to be part of our generation or this generation. And it's going to be interesting to see who the next leaders are. I think we see some of them already. So I'm excited for that. I think so. Does anybody have any more questions for Phyllis? Mm. All right, I'll let you, Phyllis, there's a question for you in the Q&A you can answer separately. Okay. We have a little bit of extra time, so I'm wondering if Carl could come back on and answer some of the questions that are in the chat. 
Um, and Phyllis, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for being such a true leader for our industry and always taking the time to speak at events and, 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 and lead us through to the next chapter of whatever that means. So thank you. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks, Connie. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your time. Bye. And Carol. I hear Carl. Hello. There he is. All right, Carl, we have a few questions for you. Okay. Any recommendations to achieve balance between convection and conduction in the drying phase of drum roasters? Yes. Um, first, I mean, obviously, that, that would that depend on on the drum roaster. It's not necessarily a drum roaster. I mean, several, the majority of all drum roasters, they are pretty much, I mean, following a design of uh, applying or supplying convective heat uh, to the coffee, particularly at the beginning. So uh, usually those roasters are being uh, the the the, uh, the air that goes to the coffee batch is, I mean, close to like 80 or very high percentage of airflow to the coffee because of wanting to roast coffee faster. While you're doing this, obviously you are drying out the beans faster because you're sending more air to the beans. So slowing the, the, the air supply to the beans down and, 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 and uh, in, in favor of conductive heat, conductive means then that the beans are being treated certainly by the drum itself, by the temperature of the drum. You don't want to make it too hot so that you scorch the beans. There is this, this very careful balance. Um, you've got to be able to control the airflow uh, that goes through the drum um, in order to slow the, the velocity plus the volume down towards more conductive heat. Uh, usually when you are almost, I mean, through the drying phase, that means the endotherm phase, then it's easier to control conductive versus uh, um, uh, convection because of you have conductive going from bean to bean. But at the beginning, this the endotherm phase where you have to supply air into the drum, it, to the roasters, you need to be able to balance this with an, uh, a lower amount of airflow, a little bit higher temperature, so that you basically have, have a, 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 a transfer from the, the drum to the bean because it's still in the endothermic phase. So the balance between the drum itself or the equipment, the flights inside, and the, and the, and the amount of coffee that you send to the beans. And some of the roasters that are designed that they only allow so and so much air during that endotherm phase to the beans. That is, that is going to go also a little bit. There's another question that I see that we can touch on. Does the bean, the first crack, does that always have to be at a time or a certain temperature? That relates to that. And this in, within the specialty coffee arena, um, people have the, they're interested in roasting a little bit longer before uh, it's not necessary. They don't want the first crack necessarily at nine and a half minutes, for example. They want to extend that a little bit longer in order to allow the the, the uh, chemical reaction times or give them more time to, uh, to react and, and to develop. Um, and, and that means you've got to slow the drying process down. And the drying process is basically controlled by the air supply, the, the volume of the air that goes to the roaster and to the batch. <clears throat> is this? I think, I think to answer that question, and this was part of that, the, the question that you actually just touched on too. Do coffee beans more or less have the same chemical reaction at a certain temperature? For example, is there only one first crack temperature for same coffee beans maintaining most other variables the same? Or is it possible that the same coffee beans crack at different temperatures if the time and atmospheric pressure or humidity varies? Uh, well, I mean that's that you have you have high density coffees and you have softer coffees, so that's 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 one uh, um, impact. I mean, or or at least I mean parameter 
that needs to be considered. And some of the, the like the higher density coffees or the higher moisture co or the lesser moisture content density of the bean, all of that, the charging temperature, all of those are parameters that determine how fast we basically are going to be able to 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 um, to cause a reaction inside the bean. We got to get to this to this to this boiling temperature in the bean and converting from a liquid into into a steam phase in order to make the reactions happening. Now you work against density. You're working against this, a softer bean over a harder bean, um, and then and then um, in general. I mean, generally, there would basically, you would see the first crack at 390, but you can have that first crack at 390 as fast as in four minutes and as slow as in 12 minutes. That's all depending upon the velocity, the roaster design, and and the velocity of the beans by which, uh, of, the, of the air by which the, 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 the air passes across the bean itself. The, we, what, what, what we have to think in terms of when we got water, when we're trying to drive the water off, we'll be creating a film, a, 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 a water film around the bean, like a thin layer of steam. The energy required to break through that layer and to get to the outside of the bean and from there have an impact to the, to the center of the bean the energy required for breaking through this film is higher than the heat co uh, uh, transfer coefficient from the from the outside of the bean to the center of the bean so so roaster design volume of air penetrating the beans density of air moisture content of air all of those are are, are parameters that that eventually give you a different result of chemical reactions that you find later on in the cup. But generally a bean, a bean, I mean, cracks at the temperature of about 380, 390, but that 380, 390 can be based on the design of the roaster either earlier or later. Thanks, Carl. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Does the chemical reactions care if it's conductive or convective? Is it the temperature and time that determine the chemical reaction, regardless of how the heat is applied? <clears throat> I would I would say no. There's you got to have coffee is roasted by air, um, uh, and but if you can control and balance <clears throat> the air, because at the same time coffee is drying out the bean, and the faster we're drying out the bean, the shorter or the, the lesser time available for the chemical reactions. So there is a balance between both of them. But if you were only applying uh, the, um, the, the uh, if you were only applying the, the conductive heat to the beans, you're risking that the outside of the bean is going to be roasted more than the inside. And you're not going to get, um, you're not going to get the, the, the temperature inside the bean uh, to, to a degree fast enough to make chemical reactions happen because the power of the air will control that, not the conductive air. You're risking more if you only had conductive air, like for example, you have beans in a pan, you got to move them too in order not to scorch the outside or you have widespread spitting. And at the same time, the, the heat transfer coefficients in order to get inside the bean depends on the water and the air velocity in order to make this all happening chemically. So it's not only only conductive heat alone is is certainly roasting coffee, but not to the extent that you that you have that ratio of convective over conductive. <clears throat> okay. Um, and I'm not sure what this question really means, but I'm going to read it. What is the maximum load capacity for specialty? Well, there's there's not there's not an, an, a load capacity. Every roaster have is, has a sweet point, um, and and um, it could keep be for example that, that you have to buying a 12 kilo roaster and you want to roast 12 kilos. 
It could be based on the coffee, it, uh, based on your location, based on the uh, humidity, that eventually you may not be able to roast 12 kilo, but maybe 10 kilos. So, so it, the sweet point you have to find out. Now, it would be wrong if, uh, if you were buying a 12 kilo and someone would buy a 12 kilo roaster and can only roast five kilos with it. Uh, that is that is that would be wrong, but um, but there is a sweet point um, with every roaster, and it has to do also with we're dealing with a natural product, which is coffee, and coffee crops are changing, uh, quality is changing, density is changing, and and last but not least, moisture content. The moisture content of the beans is a very important um, uh, factor or parameter, um, and certainly. The way the airflow, the uh, the, the therm thermal dynamics that basically goes through it to the beans uh, and to the batch and penetrate the beans during the roasting, but um, but it is not there is not in general that you're saying there is a special cap roaster capacity for roaster. Uh, no. Okay, uh, we have one last question, and it says, "Where can we get the picture on the wall behind you?" Well, you would have to come here and take a picture. <laughs> but I you know we, um, uh, I'm sure we have we, we have a a template or something like that. Um, but I have to talk, I have to talk here to the uh, responsible people. Of course, it is beautiful. Thank you. Um, we got another question. It says, "Any thoughts about emerging future roaster technologies and the application of AI to controlling roasters?" Would you mind to repeat the first part of that when that the what was nope. it? No problem. Any thoughts about emerging future roaster technologies? <clears throat> well, the the I don't think that we can uh, generally uh, uh, go away with uh, I mean ignoring the need for like roasting coffee by air. Um, the question is more towards I mean sustainability. How can we roast coffee? Um, to its optimum with uh, with the best technology. That means also being concerned about the environment um, and and uh, reducing our carbon footprint, uh, the fuel usage, and uh, for the for the roaster. Um, that that I see more uh, the uh, the development on that end of it. Um, and certainly, I mean the more efficiency, the efficiency of the roaster of the roaster itself by by um, roasting beans efficient and 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 safe in the roaster. So what I'm seeing in the future in roaster is number one, safety. Number two, the environment aspect of it. Uh, that's what I can see. But will there be an 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 I mean like a total new design development without air that we're heating up or without fossil fuel? Um, uh, of conversion for for the energy that we need in order to roast coffee, and I, I I just cannot see that over the next five or ten years on the horizon. And, but the environmental issue is is going to be, and, and the safety that those are the focuses on on in roasting technology. Definitely true. Uh, are there any books or classes about coffee chemistry that you recommend? Um. There's um, there's a lot a lot of books have been written, but um, but uh, I enjoy basically reading those books that for by scientists or the work done by scientists that basically uh, struggled with the issue of of thermodynamics of, uh, of of chemical reactions in food in general. In many cases. Um, they basically applied the, the the test or the methods and tried to find out uh, coming from from other products and applications and see how how did they apply to the to the coffee. Um, there's a whole lot of work to be done on the coffee side when it comes to chemistry. Um, uh, in particular, I mean, if I'm just looking at the degassing of coffee uh, is, a, is a is a big subject. Um, the particle size uh, grinding, particle size distribution, all of that. But um, in, in in the past in the, in the past, Clark um, uh, they had uh, focused on that. There was in the, in the early days also Michael's the late Michael Sivitz 
who has done, who came as a craft engineer, who has done, I mean, the very basics on 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 the chemistry and, and wrote a whole lot about coffee in general uh, during his time in in, in generation. But um, um, what what is available is, I mean, you, you really need to look at the chemistry, the chemist, the books, and and see those the the reactions that we talked about, the the chemical reaction, four chemical reactions, and to break them down and see to what extent they pertain to the flavor compounds and, and 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 what we're looking for, that's what that's what we're working on currently in order to communicate this better to the to our community to the coffee community, but um, categorically I cannot say read this or read that book. There are a couple of recommendations. I'm more than happy to to uh, uh, to uh, you know write something down and, and 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 send this to you or to the people that are interested in that. Excellent. And we can um, put together a list of some of our favorite books and include it in the email to the attendees after the event. We can include Carl's yeah. favorites too. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Oh, someone says write a book, Carl. Uh, <laughs> um, I need to, to ask the, the owners of Dietrich if they allow me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question. Do you envision a closed loop system using GCMS measurements in real time? Example, analyze the green coffee, to determine the flavor potential, measure the gases given off during roasting in real time. The roaster control panel then allows you to select which attributes you want to highlight, floral, fruit, characteristics. Yeah, we, we, we do this to an extent, but we, we would not be able to analyze the, the impact of the various acidities while we're roasting, um, if, if, if this is the question towards. But we're, we're analyzing with our controls. We basically analyze or looking at constantly the, the, of the physical parameters and the changes um, uh, which relate to, 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 to temperature and gas. Um, but um, uh, we can only determine the impact of the flavors uh, components that develop during the roast. There are two methods, and and they're probably not going to go away. Uh, but what we have what we have found so far, we could certainly basically interpret them into some sort of an algorithm and run them behind. And and and, and let me explain what what I mean by this. When we're done with coffee, when we're done with roasting coffee, and we have developed our profile. We first we the waiting for 24 hours and then we cup the coffee, and we we then get that sensation and it and it has to be certainly a trained palate, that sensation of 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 what we have perceived in this cup of coffee. We know where the coffee came from and so forth, but the other the only other method, in order to in order to to confirm what we're feeling what we're seeing, would be like the HPLC or gas chromatograph that we're looking at the fingerprint of this coffee. And, and once we have the fingerprint and have analyzed that and, and compare that with the cupping um, uh, profile of the cupping uh, notes that we took and, 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 and description that we took and see to what they're balanced. And I can definitely tell you, sometimes they're not always, I mean, they're off. And the way, the way we perceive sweetness, bitterness and acidity the fingerprint of the coffee, which has been analyzed by gas chromatograph or by by HPLC, may show you a different answer <laughs> or give you a different answer. All right, I see there's a question about climate change, but I'd like to wait and address that uh, later in the day when we talk about the five or the, the major takeaway questions for the day, because I think that's a big question and I'd love to hear what Rick Reinhardt has to say about that too. Uh, we're finished a little early. So I want to say thank you so much to all the speakers. We appreciate all of your, your time and your insight. It was a fantastic morning. We'll break for lunch right now and we'll meet you back here at two o'clock central time.